Gary is an ordained pastor, and he has served as a missionary first in Latin America, he and his wife Marlene, and then they, he served Gary as a professor of missions, and then uh, also has served most recently and continues in this role as, um, as regional liaison for South Asia and a large area of mission work that's happening there, based now here in Fresno, but travels often to South Asia to uh, participate and lead and support and take care of missionaries that are there and the work that God is doing there. Really a privilege to have Gary a part of us. If you've been a part of the Pastor Cadre class during our education hour, Gary has been one of our teachers there. It's a wonderful privilege. Would you join me in praying for Gary now as he comes to the Lord? I told him he could take his jacket off, um, but he has kept it on. So we'll just pray that the Lord keeps him cool and brings the word uh, in a hot way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your call on Gary's life, and we thank you so much that you have brought Gary and Merlene to be a part of our fellowship here at First Presbyterian Church. What a blessing they have already been to us in the short time that they've been here. Thank you for your awesome word. How great is your word that you have given us. Thank you. And thank you for the word that you have given us in Ruth. I pray now that you would pour out your spirit afresh on Gary, that you would bless him and encourage him and help him, Lord, to hear your voice and speak your words that you have given him to speak this morning. And then for each of us, come Holy Spirit, draw our hearts to you, speak your word, and change our lives. Yes. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. would you welcome Gary as he steps into our pulpit this morning? Last week, many of you were here as Pastor Jeremy began our summer sermon series on the gospel according to Ruth. And the Bible passage ended with Ruth, a mistrusted foreigner, uh, making an amazing pledge to her Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi. That pledge is so important. Let's read those verses again. So if you, I know there are Bibles in front of you, uh, please uh, open those Bibles to, it's before Psalms uh, in the Old Testament there. Uh, and we'll just read right now just verses 16 and 17, Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Wow, what a promise. What a woman Ruth is. I'd like to, to illustrate the, the tremendous power of Ruth's pledge uh, by using a modern example, which also allows us to go on uh, to focus in on this week's theme, which is running on empty, running on empty, as we finish up chapter 1 of Ruth. The entire nation of Britain was running on empty on January 1941. If you remember history in January 1941, not, uh, the Nazis had overrun most of Europe and the island nation of Britain was basically the only Western European country left that had not been totally dominated by Hitler. And at this time, the Germans were relentlessly bombing London, and in that way they were trying to bomb Britain into submission. Britain was the only obstacle left in Hitler's mass plan to, to establish a whole new uh, world order. The city Bible adventure talked about the human race and how we are united. And it was Hitler's definitive purpose to be the savior of the entire race with the de domination being by the German master race. A terrible travesty of understanding what it means to be the human race. 
So the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, turned to his strongest ally of the time, the United States. And the U U.S. President uh, Franklin Roosevelt sent his trusted ad advisor by the name of Harry Hopkins to express their commitment of solidarity at this critical moment in world history. They couldn't meet in uh, London. It was too dangerous. They had to go all the way up north, in, hundreds of miles away, into Glasgow, Scotland, to have this meeting. And after several nights uh, and days of negotiation, Harry Hopkins stands up before a formal dinner to have the concluding mark, remarks of this important conversation between Britain and the United States. And here are Harry Hopkins' words. I suppose you wish to know what I'm going to say to President Roosevelt on my return. Well, I'm going to quote, from you, uh, quote you one verse from the book of books. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And then he added very quietly, even to the end. The Prime Minister of Britain was stunned. Tears flowed down the chubby cheeks of Winston Churchill as he understood what Harry Hopkins had just said by using the Pledge of Ruth. He knew that the great British Empire would now have a chance to be saved through the human instruments of the United States. And history would add the, that that pledge, that sacrificial pledge that Harry Hopkins uh, offered that night came at a great and awful price because the United States lost more servicemen in the battles of World War II than Britain did in the whole World War. So as we come back to the last verses of chapter 1 in Ruth, we see that Naomi is still running on empty. She has spent 10 long years in the neighboring country of Moab, and there she lost her hum husband and both of her sons. She appears to be an old, widowed woman with no family, no future. In fact, the term widow in Hebrew literally means someone without a voice. Remember, this is the time of judges. And women, uh, women particularly, and widows even more so, were, were objects of bullying and harassment and great injustice brought against them. Why? Because widows did not have a voice. No one would speak on their behalf. So Naomi, having lost her husband, having lost her two sons, is, is just spending life bracing for the next uh, crisis that's going to try to come and overwhelm her. Naomi is running on empty. Empty of community and empty of hope. In fact, she tells the women of Bethlehem, they say, she said, don't call me Naomi, my, my name. Call me Mara, that is the bitter one. That is her response as she comes back into uh, Bethlehem and tries to pick up her life after 10 years of loss and grief. She comes back stripped of hope, and she has suffered so much that her neighbors don't even recognize her. They say to her, could that be Naomi? You know, many of us sometimes when we see uh, friends, we might say something, wow, you look great. Life has been treating you well. Well, this is what the women say. It says, wow, you look terrible. Life has been, must have been pretty tough on you. And that's right. Because Naomi went to Moab because of a famine. And we need to understand the horrors involved in a famine. You know, some of us, uh, often we might say something like, wow, I'm starving. And what we mean is, that gives me a legitimate right to go into a, a wonderful refrigerator, open up and, and help myself to whatever is there. Or, you know, wow, I'm starving. Uh, let's go to McDonald's and uh, have a, a big meal there. 
It's easy for us in the 21st century to brush past that word famine in chapter 1 and not realize the horrors that that experience was for Naomi and for the others there. Famine brings death. Famine brings lingering death, where thousands of children die because they don't even have enough energy to pick up the food and place it in their own mouth. So we can't just ignore, we can't gloss over Naomi's great pain, because if we do that, we, we miss the story that's being told. We need to take a moment to, to sit down with this woman and recognize the strength that it took for her to hold on to her faith in those kinds of circumstances. You see, her suffering, her pain, her loss is not just some kind of, of literary detail that uh, the story-inspired uh, author includes in the story of Ruth, so then we can move on to the nice love story that continues in, in starting in chapter 2. It would be a mistake for us to try to step over the shattered life of Naomi on the way for us to enjoy the, the story of, of Ruth and Boaz, because then we'll miss the intent of this story. Without a firmer grasp on her sufferings, we miss the impact of God's power to slowly and relentlessly bring hope and healing. Remember, Ruth's pledge of loyal love came to Naomi at great cost. Harry Hopkins' pledge to help Britain cost the United States of America 400,000 lives. We are not asked by God to walk through this earth with our eyes closed in rootless optimism. God invites us to pledge ourselves to one another as Ruth pledged herself to Naomi because this story helps us see that God is our only hope. He is our only power. He is the only person who can keep our faith and hope alive in those kinds of circumstances. When pain or famine or war or depression seems to overwhelm us, we recognize the pledge of Ruth is greater than that pain. Ruth actually took place in our broken world, in a broken world where the Apostle Paul says, I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Naomi's lament, her lamenting faith, is really often a healthy way to, to face squarely the pain that we experience in our lives. In fact, the laments of God's people fill uh, many of the pages of the Old Testament. One of the clearest prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament in, in Isaiah 53 is in the form of a lament. Let me read some of those verses uh, of Isaiah 53 and, and listen to the way that it's formed in a form of a, a lament, being sad. Isaiah writes, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. It's important also to note, though, that laments expressed in the Old Testament are often followed by a movement towards a firmer faith that God would graciously provide us a way in and through the pain. 
Notice that the change now in the same uh, chapter, chapter 53 of Isaiah, but note a more hopeful idea uh, as Isaiah writes, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. You see, Naomi's legitimate lament can only take her so far. As she returns to Bethlehem, her home, which literally means house of bread, she has already received the good news that the famine is over. She has probably passed by the, the barley fields there that are green, ready for harvest, green, a color that Naomi probably hasn't seen in 10 years. But now her years of emptiness blur her vision, and she's not able to, to assimilate, to understand, to see clearly the new reality right before her. She seems to be stuck in a rut. You see, her suffering has robbed her of flexibility. Her abiding faith in God has become stiff, inflexible, arthritic. I dare say this because as we read the chapter twice, Naomi speaks of her deep bitterness. She complains to her friends in Bethlehem, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Whatever the reason for Naomi's bitterness, it blinds her to the goodness of God seen in those barley shoots right around her as she returns to Bethlehem. See, she blames her misfortune on God and fails to see that God is reversing her fortunes even before she gets home. So as we need to take seriously Naomi's suffering, so we need to take seriously God's creative power to work in the midst of her suffering. The last verse in chapter 1 makes that different note very clear. Naomi seems to be stuck in her pain and lament, but then verse 22 gently moves the story in a little different direction. Verse 22, so Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is a wonderful verse. Remember, it's a story. It's an inspired story, and we have to pay attention to the, the scene is kind of closing. The, the lights are kind of going off here at this point as uh, chapter 1 concludes. But what we see here is that as Naomi blames God for her misfortune, God's creative power is in her midst. God has already brought grace and healing to Naomi. But Naomi doesn't see it. You see, Naomi literally means pleasant or my delight. And God is delighting in his wonderful daughter, Naomi, Naomi to take her to a place of joy and blessing and hope, a place that God wants for all of us to live in, a place of joy and hope and blessing. This divine blessing is right before her very eyes, and Naomi doesn't see it. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is the blessing. Before returning home to Bethlehem, Ruth has already assured her mother-in-law that she will be with her to the very end and will pick up the ragged remnants of her family and be her family with her. Ruth is not a burden. Ruth is not one more mouth to feed in a time of famine. Ruth is God's answer to her prayers. But you see, Naomi has not adjusted to this new reality that's flooding into her life. She's so used to experience pain and loss and, 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 and sorrow, she fails to recognize that God is at work. God is in control. God is the sovereign Lord of history. 
and that God always has the last word. Emptiness and pain may last for many days, but remember what King David tells us, but God's goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. I did my doctoral uh, project on five indicators of resiliency that allow missionaries to make long-term commitments to the mission field. And my findings kind of surprised me and introduced me to a new hero in the faith. I learned that we all need faith like Gumby. Faith in Gumby is, is faith that bends but does not break. Gumby has been on television for over 60 years. He's been on Saturday Night Live, and he still has the flexibility of a double-jointed three-year-old. You see, Gumby faith does not let pain and suffering have the last word. I, I, I considered that this flexibility of faith was so important that when my wife and I spent a number of years training new missionaries, at the end of the week of training, I would hand out a Gumby Award to the missionary that showed that kind of resilient faith. So around the world today, there are at least a half dozen missionaries with huge 10-inch Gumbies in their houses to remind them of the fact that we need to stay flexible as we navigate through the trials and tribulations where we are strangers, often strangers in a strange land. Naomi needed Gumby faith. As God began to fill her life with a committed community, starting with her own daughter-in-law, she needed to see that she could be flexible. How flexible are we? Maybe you need to go out and buy Gumby and put him in your house for a few weeks. As we reflect on our own flexibility, here's some questions that we can ask. How do we actually view our own immediate, our own immediate family? Think of, in the case of Naomi, couldn't even see the goodness in her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Do we see in, in our immediate family God at work or are our family members just annoying brothers or sisters or independent-minded children or aging parents? When we come to church, is church just one more hour to kind of fill up our faith quota? Or is the church an opportunity for us to sense that we belong that we belong to God, both body and soul, in this life and the next, and that some of our family members are right here. Great resources to help us grow in faith, love, and hope. So the Lord God is restoring uh, Naomi through the gift of committed community, and the Lord God is, is, uh, is meet, reaching out and touching Naomi through the provision of a more hopeful future. She comes back, and there she sees the, uh, the barley harvest. And the key about the barley harvest is there are many more harvests to come. Okay? When she sees the green, it's not just barley that she's going to see. You see, the famine is over. It's a new day. God is answering her prayers. And you see, she's been caught in, in, in a downward spiral of pain and loss and bitterness. And now God is carrying her along on an upward path towards a broader faith and a stronger hope. Soon she will learn that God will use those earthy, gritty details of a barley harvest to bring her to enjoy a new family, a family so important that that family will be a blessing to the whole nation of Israel for many generations to come. I won't tell you the answer because I don't want to steal the, fun the thunder of the following uh, sermons, but hope will be given in chapter 2. So what do we learn? We learn that disappointments can bend us but not 
break us. You might have heard of a, sky, uh, a shy, skinny teenager by the name of William Franklin Graham. William Graham wrote to his friend as a teenager, all the stars have fallen out of my sky. He was referring to uh, the fact that his college sweetheart had given him back the engagement ring that he had given to her just a few weeks previously. His college sweetheart told him that uh, she wanted to marry a man who was going to amount to something. And an older student in that uh, college, I won't even mention the college at the moment, there was an older man with loftier goals, and she was more interested in that man. Well, you can imagine that this disappointment shattered the confidence of this young teenager. But that experience served as a catalyst to renew the now world-famous Billy Graham to dedicate all of his efforts to follow the good ways of the Lord. The Bible is a living book, and so the story of Ruth is, is a living story. See, Ruth is not just about two brave, resilient, resourceful women. It's about a God who proves to be faithful and works in and around and through those faithful women. Since this is an ongoing message, as the story of Ruth helps us see that there is power in that message for us today, it's worth asking the question. How do we know that Naomi's story of moving from bitterness to wholeness is being lived out amongst God's people today? Let me just give you one example. In my 40 years in ministry, the last five have been my most difficult years. I was given a responsibility uh, of trying to move forward in a uh, mission task in the conflict-laden country of Pakistan, and things were not going well. In fact, I, I just felt overwhelmed by uh, the responsibility and the problems. And about a year and a half ago, um, I remember very clearly sitting right about there in uh, the sanctuary here, feeling very discouraged. But I also remember week after week, month after month, sitting there and, and feeling like a, 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 a rose bush wilting in the hot uh, summer Fresno sun and getting nourished again and again, and again. You see, I began to, to get in that life-giving rhythm, that rhythm of praising God from whom all blessings flow, that rhythm of confessing sin, that rhythm of allowing the Scriptures to speak to me, that rhythm of going up and asking the prayer team to pray for me. I am an example of how the story of Ruth is alive and well in First Presbyterian Church Fresno and in Hope Now and in Bethany Inner City Church as well because God is alive and well. Thanks be to him. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for Naomi's gritty faith and for Ruth's persistent love. We thank you for our friends and family members who have stood with us in our times of pain. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ who assures us that all pain, however frightening, pales in comparison to the privilege of belonging to you and to your kingdom, where death and pain will disappear, for you are making all things new. Amen.